My name is Arvind Lyman Hanavi, and you're watching or listening to the live internet studies. This is episode number 218. And in the short study version of these videos, which is broken up into two uh, segments, this first segment is given over to eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. And so eschatology is a study of end time events, such as the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you look on your screen right now, we've been, we missed a week last week due to my own personal illness. So we've got to play, play a little bit of catch up. We are working our way through these topics that you can see on my on your screen right now. This is kind of like a running syllabus, if you want to call it that. We're still in the book of Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel, and we're still looking at the 70th, the final week of years, the final seven years of important uh, history according to God's schedule and according to mankind's dealings with um, uh, God here on earth, or God's dealings with man here on earth. So we're going to probably finish this topic tonight, at least this um, part of the topic, I believe. We've been working our way through a slideshow that I'm going to jump into here in a moment. We're, we're on about slide 55, so of 80 different slides, so we're, we're near the very end. Um, and then just uh, kind of a, a, to alert you that we're working our way towards this very exciting topic six right around the corner. If we can start it next week, that would be great. If not, it might go one more week over. But the excursus, Antichrist, according to Robert Van Campen, I'll flash a little graphic on the screen of post-production, the picture of the book that I've been borrowing some of the notes from, The Sign by late Christian author Robert Van Campen, who passed away just a little over 20 years ago. And he wrote a book on end time events called The Sign, uh, named after Yeshua's discussion with his disciples in Matthew 24, when they asked him, Lord, what is the sign of the end of the age and the sign of your coming? And so he's got this chapter in, or a, a few paragraphs in his book about the coming Antichrist and how his um, identity and his actions can be related to the precursor Antichrist known as Antiochus Epiphanes, who is the um, heinous individual who is familiar to us from the book of Maccabees. And also, if you've ever uh, celebrated Hanukkah, then you're familiar with this particular name, Antiochus Epiphanes. He's a forerunner, type and shadow of Messiah of um, Antichrist to come. And so eventually we'll get to talking about this character because in my understanding of end time scriptures, Christians will be alive and not raptured yet, I say alive, I mean if Messiah returns soon, if these end time events start uh, ticking, if the clock starts ticking for the seventh week uh, within our generation, well then I don't believe that we will be raptured away before the Antichrist comes on the scene and begins to make significant strides in his dealings with mankind according to biblical prophecy. So uh, I do believe in a rapture. I just don't, I just don't believe in a pre-trib rapture. I believe in what's known as a pre-wrath rapture, which we will talk about eventually when we get down to topic number nine. But without further ado, let's jump over to the um, slideshow and we'll pick up where we left off. This is, like I said, we're about slide 56. We're in these questions that have to deal with end time um, details. We've already been looking at the seventh week of Daniel and we looked at some timing events, uh, timing details. Let's pick up where we left off two weeks ago. This is the final of these questions or about like a half a dozen questions. These are my own not uh, notes that I put together. And here's uh, the, the final question. And we'll only spend, uh, we'll finish out on this final question. And there's, like I said, there's about 30 more slides left uh, on this final question. So it'll, it'll occupy the entire hour long uh, uh, time slot that we've got available for us. And if you have, to, and if you can stay for the other 30 minute um, apologetic study on Trinity topics, biblical Unitarianism versus uh, Trinitarian perspectives, if you can stick around for that, that would be great. Um, if you can watch, uh, uh, listen and, and join us on that. All right. So the question that I started into uh, two weeks ago, and we only got like one or two slides into it is if the 70th week is yet to be fulfilled, meaning its future, why is there such a long gap between the 69th and the... I'm sorry, that's not the one we want. There we go. I just realized we already dealt with that question. Here's the question on the table tonight. If the 70th week is... Oh, let's try that one more time. Is that the one I want? There we go. That's the question. Let's get it together, Ariel. Let's try that one more time. Here is the question on the table tonight. 
question, how do we know the first seals of Revelation 6 are within the 17th week of Daniel? So you're thinking, Revelation, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with the book, don't remember exactly what, what's taking place in the, Revel, in the book of Revelation. If we have time, if we finish the study in time, uh, you know, within the uh, hour-long slot, and I have time, then I will turn to the book of Revelation and we'll read um, as much of, as of, of uh, chapter 6 as we can. But don't worry. Let's look at this chart. In fact, let me back up. That's what it says. It says, let's take a look at the chart to remind us what the seven seals of Revelation chapter 6 entail. Afterwards, we'll label each seal and place all seven, seven seals into Daniel's final week of seven years. So, remember, I'm working from the understanding that's known as futurist about four different perspectives, I'll flash a little graphic on screen, of looking at the book of Revelation and end time events. Um, one of them uh, puts all of the events over into the first century, um, the preterist perspective. And then there are perspectives that are kind of um, somewhere in the middle between the extremes of preterist and futurist. These would be called like idealist or historicist. Um, how that events in the book of Revelation kind of played themselves out over the course of history, or they're not even really, really events, literal events. They're just kind of ideas in the mind of God that he's conveying through the, the vehicle of the text. And then there's the position known as the futurist position that I take, meaning that most of what we're reading about in the book of Revelation and, and Daniel and all of the discourse, Matthew 25, Luke uh, 21, uh, Mark, um, I think it's 17, uh, those part, parts in uh, First and Second Thessalonians, the events that we're reading about are actually future, meaning they haven't taken place yet. And so that's the perspective that I take. Now, some of it is history. I, I understand that and I recognize that. But the majority of what's, what we're reading about is future. So let's look at this chart. We looked at this two weeks ago. It's just a refresher. In the book of Revelation chapter 6, John details these seven seals which are on the outside of this large scroll and this scroll containing these seven seals can only be opened by yeshua in the book of revelation that we read about remember the book of revelation the long title is the book of the revelation of jesus christ so it's not the revelation of john it's the revelation of jesus himself of yeshua so he's telling us what's going to take place yeshua is if the book of Revelation was written in the late 90s or the mid 90s, like we, like most Bible authors believe it was, myself included, instead of the early 60s, like preterists believe, then these events that we're going to be kind of looking at, examining, are future even to us in the 21st century. Or yeah, so they're future to us as well. I believe we're very, very close. I mean, we could be within a generation, meaning that that these events could start click, uh, checking themselves off right around the corner. So the seven seals of Revelation start out with the first four seals known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You've probably heard this one before. you got the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. These all correspond to the seals that I'll show you in the next slide. And then when we get to the fifth seal, it's this great martyrdom, the souls crying out under the altar that John sees in his vision. And then that follows uh, by the sixth seal, the what we call the cosmic disturbances in heaven and on earth earthquakes sun and moon and stars uh losing their light or uh going super brilliant etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the seventh seal on the list there you can see on the far right side is this great silence in heaven before according to john um the now that the scroll is open because all the seals on the outside can be have been broken by Yeshua. Now the contents of the scroll are open before us and God starts revealing uh, through his son Yeshua the judgments known as the trumpets, the trumpet judgments. And then those are quickly followed by what we call the bowl judgments. So remember, without getting too confusing, there are a, a significant number of symbols and types and shadows and uh, apocalyptic language, you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, right, in the book of Revelation. But key to understanding the book of Revelation is um, the chronology of these seven seals, followed by the seven trumpets, followed by the seven bowls, and letting them play out chronologically. All right, let's, uh, so let's continue to look at um, this slideshow. So how do we know that the first, how do we know the first seals of Revelation 6 are within the seventh week of Daniel? So the first seals, the first, if there's seven seals, we'd say like the first four or five seals. When we place these events into Daniel's final seventh week of seven years, 
the seven seals are going to look like this. And this is according to a premillennial pre-wrath model that I hold to. Premillennial means Jesus rapture and second coming are taking place prior to his establishment of his thousand year millennial kingdom on earth. Most Christians hold to some form of Jesus returning and establishing his kingdom. So it's a it's a kind of a premillennial. It's a it's a fairly popular view. Although if you're Catholic or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Jehovah's Witness, you're likely holding to what's known as an amillennial, meaning you don't even believe in a physical thousand year kingdom of Yeshua here on earth. You rather believe in a spiritual kingdom that's already living in our hearts and it's kind of embodied in the Christian church as, at, at large, the body of Messiah worldwide, international, et cetera, et cetera. There's no need to usher in a physical thousand year, literal 1000 years, Jesus ruling bodily uh, from planet earth. But again, I don't take that perspective. That's a millennial. I, oh, I hold to a pre-millennial. And pre-wrath, when it comes to rapture, he will rescue us from the wrath of God and from the wrath of Satan that will be poured out in those last days. All right, so let's look at this chart. We looked at this last uh, two weeks ago, so I'm not going to spend too much time. This is just a refresher, is that if we correspond the seals to the events down at the bottom of the screen, you can see the first seal corresponds with the kind of the bringing in of Antichrist, the revealing of this uh, rider on a white horse. He comes in as a man of peace. And he's going to hit the scene in that fashion. He's not going to be known particularly as this man of war, or this, this man of lawlessness, like Paul describes him in Thessalonians. He's not really going to be recognized right away, especially by the people that he's going to be brokering peace deals with, like, say, Israel. Right? They're going to be deceived. They're going to be deceived into thinking that he's able to bring peace between Israel and her surrounding neighbors, right? The Arab nations that are around them, that surround her. And especially some of the big players like Syria or Iraq or, um, uh, you know, some of the people a little farther north to her, maybe Russia or something like that, Iran. Um, he, and, and so if an individual shows up on the scene and you start reading in the headlines about peace in the Middle East at last, some sort of contractor covenant, that's likely... The Antichrist, who's orchestrating those particular events. So that's, in my understanding of end time events, that will probably be something that's so significant on the world scene that it will not be easy to miss. Although, again, there are, there are events that could take place before that. The, the uh, forming of a 10 nation coalition of, of governments that come together and lend all their support to a, what we might, res, might recognize as some sort of, sort of uh, revived Roman Empire or revived European Union or um, collective um, revival of what looks like the ancient Ottoman Empire, um, East uh, Rome and Western Rome coming back together again, Western Rome representing um, uh, the EU on that side of the world and Eastern Rome representing the Ottoman Empire on where, where, where modern day Turkey and um, um, Syria and uh, Iraq uh, uh, exist. So, um, if we see those, those powers kind of coming together and an individual somewhat orchestrating all these, um, events and three of those nations get uprooted, well, then that's, that's prophecy happening right before our eyes. So, uh, be on the lookout for those things, but second seal world wars, of course, uh, there's always been wars going on right now. There's currently a war between, um, Russia and Ukraine, of course, but there will be more of these types of wars, especially in that part of the world. We're talking about Middle East countries to include eventually parts of Europe because that's the scope of the end time um, battlefield, uh, end time um, stage, if you will, from the biblical perspective is it's Middle East centric, Israel being the bullseye, Israel being the um, epicenter. Eventually it's all going to um, uh, boil down to uh, everyone coming against Israel in one way, one way, shape or another. That's that's kind of the, um, it's, that's kind of the final showdown that we're looking at. The you know the Battle of Armageddon takes place right there in the land of Israel, with army with Satan amassing, uh, using the Antichrist and the false uh, Messiah, the false prophet, to um, uh, amass all of his satanic armies driven by Satan himself and the de and the demonic hosts 
to try and wipe Israel from the face of the earth, right? Because Satan hates God, he hates God's Messiah, and he hates God's people. And guess what? You don't have to be Jewish for to draw Satan's hatred. Um, if you're a Christian, you're drawing hatred, Satan's hatred. So this leads us to um, the third and fourth and fifth seals, famine, right? How much of this will be spread out across the world? We don't know exactly. The book of Revelation talks about um, uh, language that, that could be prophetic hyperbole, or it could be literal, meaning when it talks about everyone in the world who doesn't take the mark of the beast and things like that. Um, how much of the famine will be centered just in the Middle Eastern countries where all of these events are unfolding, or how much of it will spill out over into the nations of the world? We don't know exactly, but eventually we'll, we'll begin to seal, uh, see during the fourth seal mass death, fifth seal martyrdom of the dead, meaning martyrdom of the believers. Because what's going to happen at the, at the midpoint, uh, a very important event, is that according to multiple places in the Bible, Daniel... Uh, the Gospels, Paul's writings, and the book of Revelation, to name those those uh, locations, is that at the midpoint of the week, according to my understanding of Scripture, the Antichrist is going to take off his mask and reveal to the world who he truly is, that he is Satan incarnate. Indeed, according to Revelation chapter 12, Satan will enter into Antichrist and give he, this Antichrist his power. It'll be the um, evil version of the incarnation, where God came into a man in the form of Yeshua, right? God among us, God dwelling with us, Emmanuel, like we sing about him during Christmas time. Well, this will be the opposite of that, the evil version, which is Satan incarnated as the Antichrist. That's at the midpoint. And so what's he going to do? He's going to begin this persecution, first and foremost, of Israel, where he will have already set up his headquarters in Jerusalem, as far as I can understand. He will then turn on Israel, and begin persecuting her, and begin attacking her, and thus his hatred of God's people will not just be limited to the Jewish people, it will then spill over into anyone who opposes his claim to be the only true God, which of course every true Christian is going to reject him, right? He takes his seat in the temple, declaring himself to be God according to Paul's letters in Thessalonians. Well, genuine Christians aren't going to go with that. He's going to try and impose the mark of the beast, right? Set up an image in the temple, the abomination of desolation. Genuine believers are going to be rejecting that. Genuine religious people around the world are going to reject that. So thus, his campaign of martyrdom should um, begin around the fifth seal. Martyred dead, sixth seal, signs in the sky. God is going to signal that he's going to cut the Antichrist's tribulation or wrath short, and that he's about to herald what is known as not just the rapture, but also the day of the Lord, right? Jesus coming back to judge the wicked and judge the Antichrist and the beast systems. And uh, that's basically where we're looking at. Let's look at another chart that looks at those same events, just from a different perspective. Seventh week of Daniel, as it relates to Revelation chapter 6, you can see that the last seven years is broken up to neatly into three and a half years and three and a half years. And the first four seals, the ones that we're kind of looking at right now and asking this question, are they contained within the 70th week? Or since we're talking about um, beginnings of birth pangs and sorrows like Jesus talks about in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, are we looking at events really that have kind of been played out over the course of, you know, hundreds of years and thousands of years. I mean, there's always been earthquakes in, in various places in the world. You know, there's always been wars and rumors of wars. There's always been persecution if you're a believer or if you're a Jew. There's always been hunger and famine and 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 all kinds of um, cosmic disturbances. You know, there's we've always had these things. So what what makes me think that all of these things that we're reading about are really the beginning of birth pangs or why are they smashed into the last seven years? Okay, well, that's kind of what we're looking at. So the seven seals, one, Antichrist, two, war, three, famine, four, pestilence, five, martyrdom, six, cosmic disturbance, and seven, trumpet judgments. They all really are going to come into a focal point in the last seven years where mankind is basically uh, trying to usurp his own, um, kind of assert, I'm sorry, not usurp, but assert his own uh, authority and uh, dominance on the earth, right? God is letting man have his final day to try and say, we don't really need God. We don't need Messiah. We can do things our own way, right? Um, human uh, ingenuity and, and, and human effort are, are going to come to a head, essentially. 
eventually what we're going to look at is, and we, we won't do this tonight, I don't believe we'll have time, but eventually we're going to see how that, not just the book of Revelation, but Matthew's um, detail of the end time events are are parked right in the middle between our look at the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, right? Matthew falls between that. And in Matthew 24, we find one-to-one -one parallels given by Yeshua himself. No, no um, surprise there, right? Jesus is the one who gave the words to John in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it makes sense that Yeshua's own words in Matthew 24 should mirror what he gave John in Revelation chapter 6. They're, they're, it's the same... Uh, um, same um, originator of the of the, of the information, Yeshua himself. The master gave these details. So we can see uh, in Matthew 24 in that chart in this chart as we compare Matthew 24 with Revelation 6 and 7 that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, the details. We might get to that tonight. Um, we might read parts of Revelation 6, but let's finish this slideshow.